Every learning journey starts from a single point. An idea, a question, a moment of need. But without the right support, getting past that initial point can be tough. Since 1848, we've worked to ensure that no one who wants to learn feels left behind. Today, we're more committed to this cause than ever. Working to shape a fairer, more inclusive society. Combining over 170 years of education experience with deep insight and expertise, we're galvanising our sector around the greatest learning needs to anticipate demand and action what will make the greatest difference. And by bringing together world-class content and new assessment methodologies, innovative learning technology and specialist partners, our dedicated team shapes solutions that meet those needs head on, steering a more intelligent education ecosystem with an ambitious spirit and the scale to make real impact we're ready to support anyone who wants to learn at any stage of life. So that whatever their starting point, every person has the opportunity, means and motivation to access the highest quality learning experiences and the power to shape their future. We're shaping smarter learning. So the purpose of the event today is to hopefully inspire you to consider vocational qualifications for your key stage four pupils. Um, so we'll be hearing from some amazing guest speakers on how vocational education has impacted their school's performance, their pupils, and we'll also be hearing from some of the students themselves about the opportunities that vocational education has given to them. So you've just seen our brand video, um, albeit a little bit tinny in the sound. Um, and I'm sure we've got a lot of people in the audience today who are already delivering qualifications with us or have done so in the past. Um, but for those of you in the audience who don't know who we are um, or who are new to NCFE, um, welcome. Um, we are an awarding organisation, an educational charity and a leader in vocational and technical learning. And we're working together for a fairer education system for all learners to power inclusivity and choice. We've got a substantial technical education portfolio at NCFE, which supports young people aged 14 to 19 to progress through a range of subject specialisms. And we offer qualifications at various levels, including T-levels, 16 to 19 study programmes, applied generals, higher technical quals, and finally, the one that we're here to talk about today, our Visa Key Stage 4 Technical Awards. Okay, so um, I'll do a quick run through of the agenda for today's event, um, and we're expecting this to last for about an hour and a half. Um, so we'll begin with a special message from our Director of Qualifications and Assessment, Zach Aldridge. Um, we'll then have our title session, which is set to be a truly inspirational talk from soon-to-be Dr. Kevin Rumery, um, who is the Associate Assistant Principal at Ormiston Rivers Academy and is also the doctoral red doctoral researcher, sorry, in vocational education and student voice. Um, he will be speaking to you about his research into the impact of vocational education on young people. We'll then be hearing from a handful of students from Ormiston Rivers Academy who'll be sharing their experience with doing a vocational qual. And then, we'll, and then there'll be a short video message from our chief executive, David Gallagher. And then I'll be jumping back on to tell you a little bit more about NCFE's brand new visa qualifications. I'm then going to hand over to the fantastic Abdullah Dangor, who is the head of physical education at Eden Boys School, um, and he's going to share the teacher's perspective on delivering a vocational qualification. And then we'll be joined at the very end by our provider development officer, Kelly Johnson, who, alongside all of today's live speakers, will form our panel Q&A session. Um, and we'd really love for you to get involved with this throughout the event. So just drop any questions in the chat box um, throughout the event, and we'll endeavor to answer as many of those as we can during that panel session at the end. All going to plan, um, we should be able to wrap everything up at about 20 past five, and then we'll have a short networking opportunity at the end where we can enable cameras and mics. And if anybody wants to have a chat with me or any of the speakers today, um, you're free to do so. So without further ado, um, I'll welcome our Director of Qualifications and Assessment, Zach Aldridge. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really proud to be able to welcome you to our session on the power of vocational education. 
My role at NCFE finds me in the fortunate position of working with a diverse cross-section of our business, including the development teams who work on designing our qualifications and the delivery teams who support schools and ultimately the learners who study them. Most of my career has been spent in further education where I saw firsthand how powerful all education can be, but particularly vocational education. We have an education system that prepares learners nicely for the well-understood academic routes, A-levels and university, but often a lack of technical options at school leaves young people unprepared to make the best choice for them when they reach 16. A knowledge-rich curriculum suits some people, but it doesn't suit everyone, and too often, learners who are more suited to or simply want to take a vocational or technical route are forced to find out about that route on their own or by accident. Vocational learning is engaging, motivating and inspiring, enriching young people's lives as well as preparing them for different careers. Having worked with 16 to 18 year olds for a lot of years and spoken to many of them, I can confidently say firsthand that vocational education is a powerful thing and I'd encourage all schools to introduce some form of vocational learning for key stage four pupils, broadening choice and opportunity as you do so. I could sit here today and give you countless examples of the benefits of supporting learners to understand their vocational education choices. Stephen, who spoke on a stage in front of 700 college staff about his love of engineering at age 17. Alison Chloe, who stumbled across T-levels when they went for an open day at their local college and chose to study them because the practical aspects of the courses suited their career aspirations. And there are many more. The stigma attached to vocational education isn't felt by those students, and it shouldn't be felt by any students. We know vocational education at NCFE, and we want to celebrate it today and break down that stigma. Because we know that vocational courses offer great experiences for learners. They make education exciting and engaging. They lead to great outcomes, and they equip learners with transferable skills to prepare them for the real world. Today, you'll hear from experts who, like us, know what they're talking about when it comes to the power of vocational education. We have Kevin and Abdullah, who can give you the teacher's view of the impact of vocational education. But most importantly, we'll also be hearing from learners about their experiences of VCERTs and how these qualifications have supported them to progress in their lives. I hope you get something valuable out of the session, and we look forward to working with you to give learners the start they need for the future they want. Brilliant, fantastic welcome from Zach there. And I hope that's really helped to kind of set the scene for today's event and to give you a little bit of insight into what it is that we're trying to achieve at NCFE. Um, so I'm now thrilled to be able to hand over to Kevin for our title session, um, The Power of Vocational Education. So Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased I am to be here as well. Um, today, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of context for the, the school that I work in, but also for my pet project, which has uh, been happening over five years now, which is looking really, really, really closely at the really complex world of vocation education, how it's governed and how people uh, perceive it. And most of all, the most important stakeholders in the entire system, how they experience it. And my whole project's about the experience. But if I just start off with uh, my school where I work and start setting the scene a little bit. So if I could have the next slide, please. A, a Professor Witty moment there. That's uh, lovely. Thank you very much. So as you can see as a school, we, we deliver quite a number of um, NCFE qualifications uh, amongst others. And our, our portfolio of qualifications is really designed to bring out the best of our students and so they can follow their interests quite keenly. It all started a couple of years ago when um, it was actually a food course. We started off in GCSE Foods and uh, it looked like there was a lot of students in this course about to underachieve. And so we were looking very critically about what we could do about this. And what we did was split the groups up and one half took on a what was the NCFE food and nutrition at the time. And the other half, uh, class main, maintained with GCSE and we're expecting better results out of the GCSE class. Didn't happen. What happened in this particular situation is that those students that took on the more vocationally based courses actually outperformed the GCSE classes in net results, not even in progress figures. And this really inspired us to go back to what I'd been doing in the past and look really closely at what was going on with this different style of um, qualification. And it was really important not to make assumptions. Assumptions like, oh, well, they're doing better because it's easier. If you've been around vocational qualifications for a 
quite a while now, you'll know that the rigour that is going into these qualifications, especially as new versions are released and released and released, they are not the same things as they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. And then sometimes I really do think they challenge GC, well, I know they challenge and exceed rigour from GCSE qualifications in the way that everything's assessed. Can I have the next slide, please? As we wait there. So in order to really get into some research um, where you make sound conclusions, you have to do what's called look at your axiology, and that's who you are in the field. And so here's a couple of pictures here just to really sort of place things about. You can see a couple of years ago, and these are pre-COVID pictures, the bottom two there were the stuff that we were doing before um, the lockdown. We had students, they were coming out in the field, they were learning real life skills, engaging with businesses, and in quite a lot of cases, getting in the paper for some really quite cool stuff that has been done. But this isn't the only part of the, the whole makeup of the vocational world. There's the teachers as well. And I can only really talk about myself in the first instance here. I served an apprenticeship when I left school at 16. And I served my apprenticeship because I really couldn't be doing with any more GCSEs and sitting down and writing out an exam. I was done with it. And so I went to, well, I went to sea. I served on, uh, I served apprenticeship with a company that made huge marine diesel engines and I spent four years doing it. And these are very crucial things because entering the world of vocation education gives you something a little bit different, a little bit extra and these ideas developed as we go along. After I finished my apprenticeship I went to university and I still look at back at this and I wonder why I did that. A good career move you might say and yes it was to become a teacher and so on and so forth but there was something that in that experience that was different between being an apprentice, coming through vocational routes and then changing. And it started seeding an idea in my head about what is the difference? What makes something that it is? And now, 20 years later, I lead vocational courses for students all the way from 14 through to 18 and try and replicate some of the skills that was given to me. Can I have the next slide, please? So, in order to get my head around this, I had to go back to the literary sort of view. And oh, you have to understand here that a lot of these things that are going on in literature, it's actually been talked about also the teachers personally. And the first one really shocked me. And the full title of the paper was Apprenticeships, an ongoing sham. I, I felt that one, that was that was kind of a personal pain. It's like you're, you're calling those four years I spent becoming an apprentice and learning my trade a sham. I, I really struggled with that. Vocational students have a low self-image and have very little aspiration. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. This is something else I really couldn't get together in my head. You're talking about the students I've had 20 years of experience with up in Newcastle and Essex, having low self-image and little interest. These are not the students I recognise. This is really sparking me off to try and get to the bottom of what's going on here. Vocational tutors, aha, now we're talking about me as a tutor. And of course, a lot of people here are typically of low skills. Um, hang on, sorry, I've served an apprenticeship. I've got a degree in engineering, I'm teaching engineering. I've got a master's degree in education and I'm low skilled. Students are of low ability, and this was the Wolf Report, this was only 11 years ago. Students are of low ability on low value level two courses, which lead them to no career opportunities. This is certainly not a system I recognise today. I, I would contradict that. The system I see today is a system that enables students, enables them to follow their interests so keenly, it actually inspires them as opposed to suppresses them. It's a mess of student, a mess of systems. Well, actually, if you look at a lot of the changes that have been happening over the for previous few years, you could argue that that is a that is something that's been developing, but not necessarily the fault of vocational education. It does aim to reduce youth unemployment, and this is where we start looking at the history of vocational education. We start thinking about. Where does it come from? Is it the YTSC schemes in the, the famous YTS schemes back in the 70s? Where does it go back to? And we can trace the whole thing back to almost Anglo-Saxon times when we're talking about the divide between the people that went to university and the people that served apprenticeships. And we start looking at this differential that starts snowballing over the years, this great almost class divider. To cater for lesser able or disaffected students. 
Again, something that really jars me. However, there was a, a little snippet I found in a, a paper by Susie Copson, which was uh, traced back to Bill here. Those who make decisions about vocational education have little first-hand experience of it. Now, I did dig around in the background of this one, and it was surprisingly, there was a little bit of evidence behind it. So I thought maybe a lot of these misconceptions are going, uh, are coming from elsewhere. So I thought we need to try and work out what's going on here. Um, and so I thought the best thing to do is actually look at the main stakeholders, those people that live inside. Can I just get the next slide, please? So in order to look at a, a, a student experience, a contemporary student experience, you have to be quite careful about how you do it. There's all sorts of different ways in sociology and social science. I chose a method called phenomenology. A phenomenology, it goes back into German uh, sort of uh, philosophy. You don't want to read too much about it. It does bend your brain. But what I'm looking at is a hidden experience. I'm looking at how all these little things that are dripping in from newspaper accounts, from changes in vocational systems, actually affect our students and what it's giving them. And I chose a model uh, by Yuri Bronfenbrenn. Yuri Bronfenbrenn, a great guy. He did a lot of work in the 70s, working with um, disaffected students in America. And he developed a system where we start looking at how a student views the world. So a difference in way of looking at research instead of us looking in at people and drawing conclusions, we try and get ourselves as far behind the eyes of the students as we possibly can. And so <laughs> I did read most of his papers on a flight over to Ukraine once and it said, if you're interested in this stuff, please just give me a ring. And sadly, he died four years previously. So that phone calls yet to happen. A lot of the work centered about how we interpret what our students are going to say, but we hadn't even got to that point yet. We had to go back one more step. And that step was looking at, well, what I called the elephant in the room, which is a paper which we're hoping to publish shortly, which really details some novel ways of getting, well, novel, when I say novel, it almost sounds common sense when we hear that. So if we can have the next slide, please. So if we want to hear what students are saying, honestly, we've got to put them in a frame of mind where they're going to spill the beans. And if we're talking about student voice as we know it, and I've seen quite a lot of examples of it, it tends to be there's a there's a teacher leaning across a desk somewhere, and this is the worst kind of scenario, there's a teacher leaning across the desk, the desk somewhere, going, what do you think about this kind of education? And the poor student at the other side of the desk is full of fear and doesn't know what to say. You're taking a group called digital natives outside of their comfort zone. The fishes are out of the water and they're kind of panicking. So I was observing students and I was thinking, how do they communicate? And I was looking, that sat there looking at my form group at the time, and they were rather naughtily, all on their mobile phones. And I think this is how they communicate, this is how their natural mode of operation. So I thought, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the teacher. We need to have these people talk in their normal way. So this is where I say, it's like, is, it not, is it a new idea? Well, clearly new. We put the students in a room by themselves and we just gave them a mobile phone and we asked them to talk. And talk they did. And they described a really interesting world which, which deserved a lot of interpretation and thinking about. And that's, that's almost taken the past three years. Previous to this, and going back to Bronden from Brenner here, he said that developmental psychology of which, as students are developing through vocational education as a way to look at it, is a science of the behaviour of children in strange situations with strange adults. Of course, it's going to give you warped answers. Can I have the next slide, please? And so, after we got these um, transcripts, and I've put a nice little excerpt just on the bottom of the slide, then if you can read it, it, it really gives a flavour for some of the things that were coming out. And you can almost feel uh, a degree of indignation by our students, the students that are within the system. I feel like people perceive them to be easy subjects that aren't worth a lot but they're a lot harder than people expect. People are just going, ah, this is so easy. Then like with food and nutrition, and this particular student is actually talking about an NCFE course at this particular point in time. 
They go, oh, it's just cooking. And you have to learn about the, the chemical structure of polysaccharide. And then you've written it and you're like, oh, this isn't easy as I thought. And we're looking at these phrases and we're, we're feeling a certain sort of indignation of how the world views them and their education. But you're seeing something different coming back. You're not feeling a compliance. You're feeling uh, almost rejection. I am doing what I want to be doing. And so we broke it down into some meanings. And the first three words here, which I will take a little bit of time on, are the distillation of their experience. And it's not a negative thing, it's just how things are. Flux is where it all begins. And flux is something which has been happening within vocational education since 1880. We sent a team of the Queen's uh, best investigators off to Germany to, yeah, here we go, and uh, we did it again about two or three years ago. We don't seem to pick up things. We spent a team of these investigators off in 1880 to go to Germany to find out what's going on. And they were going to come back and make loads of changes to our system. And then after the war, we had the technical schools developed, the 1950s technical schools. And then we had the YTS schemes in the 70s and then through the 80s, BTEC this, BTEC that. And then through the 90s, I was in the 90s, apprenticeships were dead. And then through the noughties, the, the new um, vocational diplomas. And here we are now at T-levels. And in between, we've had lots of studies. It's almost every four years we have a study that comes out which says, oh, vocational education doesn't work. They must do something about it. Well, this isn't lost on students because they are sharing the world with us. And every time this happens, they hear it and it enters their psyche, but also the parents' psyche. And so they become aware of a world which is constantly changing. And the other thing they're aware of is that these are sometimes marginal subjects. If you are choosing to study for a, a particular qualification, they have seen their friends and relatives go through school and staffing might suddenly become an issue. And what we see within options portfolios is options going on and being removed and courses sometimes being changed halfway through because of the implicit flux in the system. And so, of course, with this in knowledge, students have to go through something which is called a risk process, the risk of making decisions. They know all about the flux. They know the potential hazards. But this is where something key starts developing and starts rising to the top. It's an opportunity to follow the passion, what they want to do. And so when we see this wide plethora of options available to them within drama, dance, music, engineering, sport, the things that actually have piqued their interest, the things that they want to do, <laughs> as they say when they grow up. But there's a risk to it, and the risk is that it might not be seen as uh, an equal value. And the compromise that has to be made, the compromise is um, within the decisions that they make, which is a direct result of the flux and the risk. And you see this whole world build up, and you see them talking about this inconsistency, insecurity, this lack of control and fragility in a chosen pathway and the imposed conflicts. And this, this, if you're not careful, it starts to build a, a kind of negative image in your head. But when we dig further, there isn't that there. It's a whole world. It's a different understanding. But we have to understand that these are students going through an educational process. And if I can have the next slide, that'd be lovely. And there's a little a little, sorry, my, my SX accent comes from There's a little picture just on the side of this slide, and it shows what Bruner and Zygotsky called the zone of proximal development. And this is where we really start thinking about how students develop through the pressures that vocational education exerts on them. And you have to remember that education is always a pressured process. And so what we see is you students within a learning zone, they're describing stresses, they're describing problems, but unlike, and I won't say unlike, it's comparative, but alongside maybe academic education, not only are they learning in terms of cognitive and memory and things like that, there's something else which is going alongside. And Susie Copson identified this when she was looking at Swedish systems and then English systems, something about the greater value of the experience. 
And so when we look at um, Bloom's taxonomy, and I know I'm going back to 1954 and there's been loads of taxonomies since then, we always think about the cognitive domain. But there's two other taxonomies and we ignore them as teachers and we forget about them because they're quite hard to understand. And one of those is the effective domain. And that's how we build relationships and how we interact as people. And the other one is the psychomotor domain, and that's how we learn with hands and do things. And actually, and musicians would almost call it muscle memory. So we end up in this situation where we start looking at reframing what the vocational education does for our learners. So as an example, I teach motor vehicle technology. I have my students in the garage. And we don't just sit there and we don't learn about how to take a car apart and put it back together again. We learn other things. We learn about teamwork. We learn about communication. We learn about how to talk to people that are customers. We learn about how also other people in the trade talk to each other. We learn how to fit in. We learn how to understand the needs of other people in the same industry as ourselves. And so aside from learning the cognitive stuff, how to take things apart, put things back together, how to learn all the theory, because cars are quite complicated things, how to get all the theory in our heads, how to pass the exams, but also how to meet deadlines, how to be honest, how to know when, uh, how to communicate when you're not going to meet those deadlines. So I go back to Alice Wolf, and she said that we are very prone in England to assume that everything we do is worse than elsewhere. Well, we've been doing that for a long time, haven't we? With the, even in 1880 with Germany, going off to Germany and trying to find what was better out there, why we are failing as a country, we weren't. And why we've been off in the past 10 years again and done the same thing. We weren't necessarily doing anything too badly. Soon, industry is going to start demanding, it already does, we demand work-ready people, technical skills and soft skills. And we've been talking about that already. And we go back to 1880 and we talk about this idea of building and it used to be the great German education system. And we build up people with the knowledge and education that's necessary to thrive in a society and moral and emotional security. This all starts sounding familiar, doesn't it? Education in terms of vocation is hard on our students because we're not just addressing the cognitive development. We are addressing something much more. We are shaping people to become useful members of society with the work, attitudes and knowledge and social skills to boot. This is an absolutely crucial part of what we do as people. And it's just echoed there at Susie Copson just on the bottom again 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 one of my favourite authors. Being a vocational teacher, hey that's me, this sounds a lot better than the stuff I was talking about in the studies at the beginning of this talk means helping young vocational students grow up holistically, the whole person. Fostering for life means a vocational teacher's guidance of the student into adulthood in a more general sense. So this is what we do. And if I can get the next slide, I'm not going to read this out to you, but it summarises everything that I say here. It has got its challenges and often it's misunderstood. But there is a vast power in it, in amongst many of the other powers that vocational education does have, and we need to give to our students to ensure their success in future years. And it's more just knowledge and facts. It's about how to be effective, great, honest, reliable people that know how to solve problems and are self-starting. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, really enjoyed that session. And you're so right, there's so much more to vocational education than just that knowledge piece. And I think we've been banging the drum for that for a long time. So thanks very much. Thank you. OK, so if that wasn't enough to convince you of the power of vocational education, um, we're now going to hear from some of the lovely students at Ormiston Rivers Academy about their experience. And this is another video, so please do bear with us if the sound isn't great. Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm in year 13. Uh, when I was in year 11, I completed the BSOC qualification in health and fitness. Uh, this is level one and two. 
Uh, as part of this, uh, it's split into an exam and coursework. And uh, about the coursework, uh, I really like the coursework just because it makes you more independent and prepares you for research tasks uh, and the level three part of the course. And I, I find that this level one and two um, part of the qualification really does lead you into the level three nicely. Uh, I'd highly recommend this course. I feel like it it's quite more uh, realistic and gives you an idea of uh, how work is later in life uh, because it's not just one exam like you might have for uh, like your English and maths and sciences. Uh, so yeah, it gives you a, a broader range of exam styles um, that will help you out in the future. My experience with vocational education started in GCSE. I studied childcare and health and social care. I've been doing childcare and health, health and social care from GCSE to A-level. And this has made my experience better because I've increased my knowledge in different sectors like my nursing, childcare and all that. I think that vocational education is important to young people because it would give them the skills that they would need for university. In year nine, I decided to choose design construction engineering because they fed my interests. I always wanted to know what happens in a car, what makes it move, and then also with aircraft, which is what I'm currently pursuing. Um, however, in the, from the years in nine to 11, um, it was more of a stepping stone to getting towards into sixth form so I could then study level three engineering in which um, the career I'm pursuing is going into the RAF as an aircraft technician and this will help me get towards that goal. So my experiences with vocational education is actually quite unique because when I was younger and I did my GCSEs in sciences it actually didn't give me what I needed to pursue my dream. My dream would be to study paramedic science and eventually become a paramedic in the NHS and, science, and the science that I took didn't actually give me the proper knowledge or the proper qualified experience to move on to that course. So the vocational course that I took with the health and social care at GCSE, then I also pursued that at A-level and childcare at A-level. This was important because it gave me the sort of set of skills and the unique abilities to pursue my dreams and actually study at university. It also gives generic skills as well. For example, organisational skills, communication uh, skills and teamwork skills are very common in vocational studies because there's often tasks where you have to work together, you're sort of talking with each other, sharing those, being able to improve your own pieces of coursework as well. In year 11 I studied engineering and cooking as they were my interests and it's a, it's a very good thing because it gives other people who don't who struggle with learning GCSE stuff the chance to prove themselves and prove that they are capable of more. And that's given me the opportunity to study cooking and engineering to a further level and help, help myself get to the apprenticeship that I want to get, which is in engineering. And so in year 10 and 11 I studied business and engineering and in year 12 and 13 I've studied uh, level 3 engineering and they're going to be very useful in the future because it's allowed me to experience like getting kind of like hands on to what these industries involve. Um, so one advantage of schools offering vocational qualifications is that you can get an early start into something that you're going to enjoy and potentially pursue as a career when you're older. Brilliant, thanks for that. So we will share the videos with everybody after the event today. Um, and I think what was really interesting about that video, if you could pick it out, is that all of the different learners had really different aspirations for progression. And it's just really inspiring, you know, like these kids are the paramedics, the engineers, the healthcare workers of our future. And it really is just such a privilege to be a part of that journey with them. Okay, so the next session we've got is all about our VSET Technical Awards and we'll start this session with another short video from our Chief Executive, David Gallagher. I'm really pleased to join you today to share a short message as we celebrate the launch of 11 new VSET qualifications which will be available at Key Stage 4 and in performance tables for 24 uh, and 25 the academic years. It's really exciting to see such a broad variety of choice including food and cookery, sports studies, creative design and production 
uh, amongst others. And we know that this choice of learning will best meet the needs of a, of a wide variety of learners and, and their interests and their preferences. But we're also really hopeful that it will spark all sorts of ideas and passions for future learning and on into employment and, and hopefully fantastic long-term careers. So we're really through these qualifications laying down fantastic foundations for our young people to go on and have successful careers and hopefully successful lives as well. Uh, these new qualifications hopefully demonstrate our commitment to ensuring that learners get the best possible outcomes that meet their needs and also fulfil their potential and their opportunities through providing the best possible experience for learners. So we're going to work very closely with our educational institutions, so schools and colleges, to make sure that the delivery of these qualifications is the best it can possibly be to get the best deal for our learners, meaning that they get great outcomes and, and go on, go on uh, successfully into the future. It's also, I think, fantastic that it's been recognised that the true value and the potential of vocational and technical qualifications for our young people as we enter into uh, what is now being labelled as the skills economy, you know, merging the knowledge economy in the UK with the skills economy to make sure that our young people are set up for success over their lifetime of learning and, and, and again, their career. Uh, these new qualifications, we think they will open up possibilities uh, they will uh, create opportunities for progression into further education, into apprenticeships, into employment, and then possibly also on into future into, into university as well. So the qualifications really do set some fantastic foundations. Absolutely, it's all about technical and vocational skills, but these qualifications will also be infused with the delivery of really deeply human skills to help people to develop the skills that are going to be needed uh, to, to move into the workplace. And hopefully, most importantly of all, they will provide the inspiration for people to really find out what's going to be right for them and their future. So in future years, we're really looking forward to working with hundreds of educational institutions and educators to deliver great experiences for thousands of learners through these new VSERT qualifications. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, so now you are back with me for the next 15 minutes or so, and I'm going to tell you all about the new VSERT Technical Awards, which we are going to be launching for First Teach this September. So I'll start by reminding you a little bit about the changes that were brought in by the DfE for the new Tech Awards. And I'll follow that up with um, a whistle stop tour of the new VSERT quals. And I'll then finish just by talking you through some of the support that we offer at NCFE, um, just to make sure you can really hit the ground running with these new qualifications and really get to know your VSERTs. Because ultimately it is you guys in the audience today who are the ones who are gonna be on the front line bringing these qualifications to life for the pupils. Okay, so there have been no new qualifications added to performance tables since 2018. So we've had a relatively long sustained period of stability in the world of vocational qualifications. The new technical guidance um, and the new technical qualifications for that matter um, have really been a long time in the making. And now that they've launched, we've seen a massive shift in that kind of vocational qualifications landscape, certainly for 24 and 25 um, performance tables. So where there used to be around 74 qualifications approved for performance tables, we're now down to just 48. And that really is a good thing, I think, you know, we can all be really confident that everything that's now on them performance tables are all really high quality level one and two qualifications which ultimately are of great value to the pupils and i just want to pick out some of the key points from the technical guidance as well so some of the new rules that we have to stick to um, and the first one is that all of the qualifications are a minimum of 120 glh um, so similar if not equal in size to gcse's the minimum requirements for the marks available through assessment by examination is 40% um, and they have introduced a terminal assessment rule as well, which sounds really ominous, um, but actually this just means that the assessment by exam must be taken at the very end of the course of study. Um, so that's the last thing that a student would do towards that qualification. Um, this kind of leads on to the non-exam assessment. Um, so up to 60% of the total qualification marks are available through the non-exam assessment. And this is kind of the coursework or the project element of the quals. So any of you who have delivered a visa with us previously and are familiar with the Synoptic project, um, it's essentially the same thing. 
Um, and finally, that non-exam assessment is now going to be numerically marked rather than graded. So all of the marks would then come to us for moderation um, by the award and organisation. So those are the new rules. Um, and now I'll take you through how we've applied these specifically to our suite of visa qualifications. Fab. So you will be pleased to know that all 11 of the VSETs are going to follow the same basic structure. Um, so they'll all be relatively similar and I'll cover this aspect in quite a lot of detail. So firstly, the new VSETs are all a single unit structure. So there's multiple content areas within each, each qualification um, that you can find details of in the qual specs. And for the assessments, this means that content could be sampled from across the full breadth of the qualification. So it's super important that your learners have been taught everything before they begin any of those summative assessments. The qualifications are designed to be delivered across 120 hours, um, but the guided learning hours do vary between the qualifications just to accommodate that assessment time. So they're essentially all going to follow 120 hours of delivery plus between 15 and 24 hours of assessment time, depending on the nature of that project. All of the qualifications are now level one and two combined, so they'll recognise the achievements of all pupils, no matter what their ability. Um, and they're all going to be graded from level one pass merit distinction through to level two pass merit distinction distinction star. And that's the equivalent to GCSE, GCSE grades 8.5 to one. And as I said before, all of the VSET technical awards will count towards the open group of your progress eight measures. So they're in that third bucket. So at the bottom of the screen now, you should be able to see that we've demonstrated a typical two year delivery model. Um, and like I say, this will be exactly the same for every visa. So no surprise assessments or projects on any of these. Um, and I guess the huge benefit um, to this is that if you're at a school that's delivering multiple VSETs, but perhaps you're the only teacher who's delivering the engineering visa, for example, um, you're not alone, like all of the vocational teachers at your school are going to be going through the same thing at the same time if they're doing a visa. So you can really kind of support each other through them crucial stages of the delivery. OK, so just going a little bit closer on that delivery model. Um, those with eagle eyes might have noticed that it is very similar to a GCSE model um, and that is intentional. So the DfE said that technical awards should be designed to complement and supplement the academic curriculum to support appropriate delivery in schools and to promote positive teaching practice. And we thought what better way to do this than to really make the VSETs accessible to schools than to mirror that GCSE model that we all already know so well and we're already familiar with. So you will notice on um, on the timetable there that the first year is purely delivery so there won't be any summative assessments in the first year now that's because we think it's really important to build up the pupils knowledge skills and confidence during that first year so that they feel ready for the assessments when they come around in the second year and so that they don't feel like they're being thrown into anything summative too soon you as teachers as well um, won't need to think about any summative assessments until the second year when that um, non-exam assessment brief will be released um, and you know as the VSETs do get embedded into your curriculum and you know you start juggling the year 10 cohort with the year 11 cohort hopefully having all of the assessments in that final year will really help you manage that kind of um, assessment administration because you'll never have to juggle assessments between multiple year groups at the same time and I think really it's that familiar cycle and that same kind of rhythm of as the GCSEs which not only is beneficial for the teachers who are trying to deliver vocational qualifications, but it's also really beneficial for the pupils too. So they're not going to get pulled out of a class to sit an exam at a strange time of year, and they're not really going to get made to feel any different from the kids who are doing the academic qualifications. Um, the only difference with these ones, and I am biased, I'll admit, um, but the only difference is going to be that they're doing something far more exciting than the kids doing the academic quals. OK, so I'll talk a little bit about the assessments. Um, so the NEA is a project based assessment, like I said, similar to the synoptic projects you have done previously, and it's going to consist of multiple tasks. And generally, this will count towards 60 percent of the overall grade on the VSETs. Um, but there are two of the new VSETs where it will count for 50 percent. So we would expect um, the non-exam assessment to be administered between January and March of that second year of delivery. Um, 
and that would then need to be internally marked, um, IQ'd, and then submitted to us by the end of April to be externally moderated. You'll then have some time back with your pupils for revision, um, and we recommend you do that ahead of that external exam, which would count for the remaining 40% of that qualifications assessment. And the external exam will consist of multiple choice questions, short answer and extended response questions. So again, something you should be familiar with if you've done our previous model VSERTs. And we'll be working really closely with JCQ to ensure that the exam timetables are really nicely aligned with the GCSE. So hopefully there'll be no nasty clashes in there for anybody. OK, so this next part is important um, and stay with me on it. There will only be one attempt at each assessment, so we're not allowing resets this time round. And before you all storm out and leave in protest, um, please let me explain why we've designed it this way. Um, so we did think long and hard about how to structure our assessments and whether or not we could add any extra windows in to allow a bit of flexibility. And ultimately, with the new model and with the kind of technical guidance from the DfE, we just deemed that this approach was going to be the most appropriate balance um, for our VSERTs. Um, and that's because you really do need to teach all of the content before any of that summative assessment starts. Um, otherwise, the kids are at risk of not being taught what's being assessed. And, you know, the very nature of a vocational qualification is that all of the knowledge and skills are so intrinsically linked and so integral that it's really difficult to try and segment a project up into smaller chunks um, without having that kind of full breadth and depth of knowledge. Um, and it was for this reason as well that we really wanted to give you as much time as possible to do this before the summative assessments begin um, and essentially give you a better chance of your pupils succeeding the first time around on the assessments. And the final reason for essentially doing it this way um, was to not overburden teachers as well with assessment admin. So we know that the assessment admin is increasing because we're having to mark IQA and then send to, send to us for moderation this year. Um, and we just thought the more windows we put in, the more kind of um, administrative time it's going to take to get them sorted. And essentially, we just deemed that teachers' time is best spent teaching. OK, so hopefully you're all still with me and you haven't left me in an empty room after that. Um, but I have got some more good news for you on the assessment front. Um, so we are going to be supplying sample assessment materials for both the NEA and the EA complete with mark schemes um, for you to use as mocks or as practice projects. And these will be available on our website in the next month or so. Um, so these will give you the flexibility to kind of deliver these whenever you want to do them, whenever's best for your school's um, exam timetable. You can kind of put the mocks on and mark them and get that kind of formative assessment up front. Right, so those were the key points about the VSERT structure. And without further ado, I think we should probably take a look at the brand new subject lineup. There we go. So we have redeveloped a lot of the old favourites. So um, things like business and enterprise, child development and care, engineering, health and fitness. These are all existing VSERTs which have had um, a redevelopment, a content refresh, and they're all staying on the performance tables, which is brilliant news. And then you'll spot a couple of new ones on there as well. And I think David alluded to this in his intro. Um, so brand new for this year, we've got creative design and production. Um, so this is similar to design technology, and that's brand new for this year. And then we've also got sports studies launching, which is super exciting for us, because if you're delivering our health and fitness qualification and you want something which focuses a little bit more on the sporting element of PE, we've now got options for you as well. And then my favourite, everyone's favourite, um, food and cookery is back. So um, after a brief hiatus from the performance tables, we're absolutely thrilled to be able to offer this one again from September. <laughs> I see some applause there, great. So um, this leads really nicely onto the final slide um, from me, I guess, which is just about the support that's available from us at NCFE. So all of the qual specs alongside fact sheets are all already available on the VSERTS website. Um, so please do visit that page after the webinar today and check them out. Um, sample assessment materials will be on that same web page very shortly. Um, they'll be available to kind of give you that feel for the assessments, have a look at what it's going to entail um, and understand them a little bit more. Um, and of course, you can use them, like I say, for the formative assessments and mocks um, as you start teaching. 
okay, we're also going to have options evening packs. Um, so this is in order to help pupils make informed decisions about which qualifications they would like to take. So we'll have some downloadable resources ready for you. Um, and these will include, you know, you'll have the information for teachers. So you'll have the 14 to 16 brochure, which details all of our VSERTs. Um, but we'll also have um, information for pupils and parents. So, you know, enabling them to really understand what the course entails, um, what VSERTs are, what the progression opportunities are, and what the career prospects are as well. We'll also be offering free classroom packs, um, which contain ready to go teaching and learning materials. So this will be um, kind of detailed schemes of work or schemes of learning, PowerPoint presentations for every session that you'll be delivering um, on each of the qualifications and classroom activities in the form of workbooks as well to really help you to embed that learning with the um, pupils. And we will supply these in an editable format. So while they are perfectly good to use exactly as they are, um, we wanted to make sure that you can make changes to them if you want. You can customise them, put your school branding on them, add some extra examples in if that's what you want to do. Um, so, yeah, you can kind of tweak them as much as you like. Next point um, on the support available is um, when you sign up to be a centre with NCFE, you'll get a dedicated EQA and account manager. And essentially that just means that there's always somebody at the other end of the phone or at the other end of the email who can give you any support, guidance, ask, answer any questions and kind of, you know, just help you as you need it. Okay, I'm going to try for a little bit of audience participation now. Um, so bear with me. Has anybody attended any of our training webinars before? So if you could react in some way, whether that's a clap or a love heart or a thumbs up some applause that's good one person <laughs> brilliant so that's great so we will be continuing with these kind of these training webinars as well so kelly who's joining our um our q a panel next um she'll be running uh, she'll be running lots of these throughout the year to support you as well um, and we're actually kicking off um, some of the webinars next week, starting with our subject discovery webinars. So these are going to be a kind of deep dive into each of the research subjects. Um, so you'll have a look at the content in more detail, the assessments in more detail. Um, so, yeah, I'll send um, I think we'll be sharing details of that on the follow up email after the webinar. So you can book yourself onto any of those subject discoveries over the next few weeks. OK, and the final thing on um, the support that we're going to have available, um, we are really excited to let you know that our prep to teach roadshows are going to be making a comeback this year as well. So um, dates and times and locations are still all TBC, but do keep an eye on the web page for information about when our face to face training events are going to be coming back. Brilliant. OK, I did have one more slide. Just um, last one is just a really quick reminder of the NCFE website and the VSERTs page. So I've put the link on the screen for you there now. Um, and that's where you can find all the specs um, and, the, um, and the fact sheets at the moment. And that's also where the assessments will be. Um, and I think that's it for my session. So if you've got any more questions off the back of this, do pop them in the chat. I've seen a couple coming through as I've been speaking. Um, and we'll try and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A session. Brilliant. So now, um, who's up next? Now we have Abdullah up next, and I'm thrilled to be able to hand over to him, and he's going to speak to you all about um, delivering VSERTs from a teacher's perspective. So over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving you a, a breakdown to the course. Um, there are two units in the health and fitness qualification. 60% um, is an internal assessment and 40% is the external assessment. So uh, this really, you know, this, this can be advantageous because pupils who struggle with retention uh, and all exam, exam based skills, uh, you know, you can work towards pupils strengths. So, for example, if a pupil uh, doesn't perform strongly in, in one particular unit, a large segment of the course remains. Um, so if a pupil, for example, achieves a pass in the, in the exam, they, they can still achieve a distinction grade overall with the internal assessment. Um, uh, also, if, if a pupil achieves well in the exam as well as as well as the coursework, we can we can push for those distinction star grades. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, what benefits does this qualification have for learners, and what skills do they gain? Um, 
I'm I'm a real fan of the, of the NCV Health and Fitness uh, visa because I mean I've I've got experience delivering a range of vocational qualifications. I've, I've delivered B B Tech, uh, YMCA. Um, I, I've stuck with NCFE now for this is going to be my fourth year of delivering this qualification. Um, the the content that's involved, you know, it's it's, it's great content anatomy and physiology. Uh, this cross curric uh, curricular links to uh, a range of career interests that we have kids who who want to pursue medicine, uh, learning about the bones, you know, physiotherapy, sports therapy. Uh, you can take the gym instructing personal training route. Um, you know, it's unique in, uh, compared to, to, to other sort of sports related qualifications. Um, we, we've got some uh, amazing success stories as well of pupils. We've had, we've had pupils who have used this qualification to help them get into grammar schools. We've had pupils go into specialist uh, boxing colleges, uh, specialist football colleges. Uh, and, we, you know, we've given them the kickstart to be able to pursue that. Um, the learning outcomes as well um, comply with embedding literacy, numeracy skills. So, for example, uh, pupils have to be able to calculate things like MHR, uh, you know, use equations, um, calculating BMI. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, what are the benefits for staff? So, um, I mentioned that there's an external assessment and internal assessment. So, um, you know, you can you can use a variety of teaching methods to help prepare the pupils. Um, NCF provide a lot of supportive teaching resources and teaching materials like um, Harriet mentioned uh, workbooks. Um, we, we, we have taken those resources. And we've adapted them. So we, we at our school use teach like a champion strategy, sort of doing our activities at the start of the lesson. I do, we do, you do. Um, the curriculum uh, is, is coherently planned. There's resources that, that help you with the planning. It's sequenced, you know, so we, we, we're aiming to achieve cumulatively sufficient knowledge, providing pupils with skills for future learning and employment. Uh, I think the content has real world application. You know, we're encouraging a better lifestyle. Uh, we're teaching the pupils about diet, nutrition, uh, understanding different muscle groups, training methods, ultimately for uh, a better body shape. You know, a lot of our youngsters are starting gym memberships at the age of 15, 16. Um, and, and, and also uh, there, there's a range of content. So, you know, different teachers like different topics. Some of my colleagues prefer prefer um, to teach things like components of fitness. I prefer things like anatomy and physiology. So there's so there's something for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I mentioned uh, resources earlier. Um, we we you know the resources are excellent we've got um, there's a there's a, a revision guide that we use and we actually use embed this into our lessons so we distribute the health and fitness cards at the start of the academic year and uh, we encourage people to use these open them uh, have them out in lesson uh, we can use them to uh, uh, plan, plan activities within the lesson um, what i really like is uh, the uh, exemplars provided for the internal assessment so for the for the project synoptic project um, we um, or the non-exam assessment, uh, they're, they're provided a distinction example, a, a merit example, a past level example. So we, we 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 see that as a waggle. So what a good one looks like. We actually use these with the pupils to sort of set the standard for the quality of work um, that, that we want to achieve. Uh, we can we can use those examples to draw success criteria. Um, and it, at the same time, it's actually a student's piece of work uh, that they've provided. So that helps to motivate our pupils as well. Um, but yeah, these resources definitely help to uh, provide pupils with clear understanding, expectations and, and goals. Um, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so these are these are one of my favorite things about about um, delivering uh, the NCF visa. Um, so we have these fantastic quizzes that they provide and they actually got a quiz already pre-designed for each topic so once you completed teaching the skeletal system we've got a quiz uh, one uh, same for the muscular system the respiratory system and so on uh, and it's excellent because we, you know we we use these at half termly basis so we've actually embedded these into our medium term plans our long term plans and um, you know it's an, we take we do we, we do it as an official assessment uh, and we you know we we use it half termly at the end of each topic and it just helps us check for understanding it helps us to identify misconceptions uh, in the learning we can use it to then plan future lessons and close the gaps um, and also obviously ncf provide the answers um you, you know we've got the, uh, they, they provide the answers for us as well so uh, these are excellent they're, i think there's, there's there, we've got there's about eight nine of these at the end of each topic um, all together, so uh, they're brilliant. Um, on to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so practical elements. Um, of course, in health and fitness, there, there are some practical elements um, embedded into, into the achievement um, criteria, success criteria. Uh, ultimately, pupils, they, they really enjoy taking part in, in, in the practical elements. There's a range of fitness testing um, involved. So you can see all these components of fitness. We use a range of uh, tests, for example, the, the multi-stage fitness test or the bleep test. Uh, we've got a device so, so for, uh, muscular strength test, um, flexibility, uh, sit and reach test, body composition, calculating people's BMI. You know, these are, these are excellent skills that the people are developing. We get them to test each other, learn the skills to test each other. Uh, you know, um, uh, pupils are analysing their performances in their fitness tests and um, they, they demonstrate improvement in, in, in their ability to co complete a, a fitness test and they're comparing their results to previous ones, comparing their results to the normative data out there, what's good, what's below average, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, pupils are really actively engaged in the practical elements and what's great is we can, we can make links between the theoretical side of things and as well as the, the, the practical side. So they can, the pupils are able to make those links. Uh, you know, so for example, if we're doing the cardiovascular endurance fitness test or the bleep test, pupils are able to identify that look, this is aerobic endurance, it's to do with the cardiovascular system that service taught us, it's to do with the heart's ability to pump blood and oxygen, nutrients around to the muscles, etc. You know, obviously the practical elements have um, encouraged active involvement, so it does help actually with um, with avoiding misconceptions because um, you know studies and research has actually shown that if pupils actually learn by doing, they're, they're making connections and in their memory and experiences. So you're actually fostering better understanding and ultimately helping to improve outcomes because uh, as, um, some of this content comes up in, in in say external assessment and internal assessment. Uh, yeah, and ready for the next slide. Why do you think vocational education is important in preparing learners for their future? Um, look, ultimately, uh, the, the, the LOs, the learning outcomes, meet the needs of the national curriculum. Uh, for example, um, I can quote LO1, understand the impact of lifestyle on health and fitness. So, you know, we're supporting uh, understanding and developing interest of, of pupils to get involved in exercise and sport out of school and, and, and hopefully in later life. So we're meeting the needs of the national curriculum, first of all. Um, students will develop a, a range of skills, uh, especially in the internal assessment, such as IT based skills. We, we're teaching them how to use um, things like Microsoft Word, uh, PowerPoint presentations, uh, interviews. Uh, there's a variety of assessment methods that, you, that they allow you to choose in the internal assessment. Uh, you know, pupils are developing organisation research based skills. Uh, we're introducing things like plagiarism uh, when it comes to the internal assessment and the coursework. Uh, and, um, you know, for, for, for a lot of young people, uh, studying <coughs> vocational qualifications such as the health and fitness, you know, it's an effective way for, for them to access further education um, and, and skilled employment. You know, the, the, this is a well established, it's a high quality qualification and um, it's popular with the students, it's popular with the students here um, and we see that in, for example, our intervention, interventions that we offer after school, um, exam workshops, we have we have high, high attendance rates um, and, you know, the, these courses are, are respected by um, colleges, um, six forms, employers, etc. So um, I'd just like to summarise then, uh, uh, you know, I think that the course provides a quality of education and, you know, if we look at intent, impact, implementation and impact, I think for intent, you know, the, the curriculum plans set out clear knowledge and skills for pupils to gain at each stage of the qualification with the with the LOs. Uh, in terms of implementation, you know, uh, we translate that into a structure over, over time. So there's a spiral curriculum, each unit links to the other. So the two units, you know, the one unit can help with the, uh, the learning in the, in the second unit. Unit one progresses to unit two, um, and in terms of impact, look, I've been delivering this uh, course here now. This is going to be the fourth year of delivery, and we can certainly uh, we've evaluated that pupils have gained significant knowledge and understanding. Uh, you know, we're providing pupils with with, with a viable pathway. Um, you know, after the GCSEs, after after the uh, after their uh, vocational qualifications, into post sixteen qualification. Um, you know, and particularly helping uh, those from disadvantaged backgrounds as well. Um, ultimately, we're helping people have a more rounded CV. You know, you, they can show that they can do theory as well as practical based um, uh, qualification. <coughs> um, that's that, I think that's all from me. Um, thank you very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Abdullah. Thanks, Abdullah. Um, um,
That was great. So I think we're moving straight on now to the Q&A session. Um, so that's going to be held with myself, um, Abdullah, if you can stick around in case we get any teacher questions for you. Um, we'll have Kevin and we're also going to have Kelly if she's about. So if you're there, Kelly, give us a wave um, and we'll try and answer as many questions um, as we can. So one of the first ones I've seen coming through is um, it wasn't a question, but it was a comment just that the terminal exam change is um, huge. And it is. Um, we are all in the same boat in the kind of technical awards sector. That's one of the rules that was stipulated by the DfE. And I think between us, the exam boards have come up with different solutions to try and make that as um, as kind of accessible as possible um, for the for the students and for the teachers. Um, another question that we had come through was around FE colleges. Um, so that was, are any of the qualifications suitable for teaching at an FE college um, for those students on a one year problem, uh, program? Uh, so yes, I believe they are going to be funded for 16 plus. Um, so that'd be fine for those on a one year program. Um, but if you do want to follow up with us directly on that, we can obviously, you know, check that out for you properly and confirm for certain um, whether that would be appropriate. Okay, one of the other questions that we'd had coming through, and this was by email pre, um, prior to the event, and that's what's the biggest difference between teaching a vocational qualification versus teaching a GCSE? Um, so, Abdullah and Kevin, I don't know if you two want to kind of tag team that one. Um, it's a good one. I mean, because I've talked um, both, and I think that. Um, you have to look quite differently. So if you're talking about the difference between teaching a GCSE without an NEA and uh, vocational qualifications, it's not just about the NEA, but the idea that it's project based and there's a, a whole lot more um, independence and self starting involved in what you're doing, especially through um, those assignments that you're given. And that really um, is different from a GCSE course with a terminal exam. It allows as with some of the feedback that we had, it allows students to express themselves a little bit more and get a little bit more of their personality into the projects. It was um, one of quite more interesting lines I had back. But also with the, I mean, currently with vocational um, qualifications, uh, this isn't moving forward, of course, the idea that there is, um, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. You don't just have to turn up on the exam day and just thrash it out and everything's going to be great. It takes a lot longer. It takes a lot more input. That's a good thing, though, yeah, <laughs> because because it, we're talking about um, so I'm almost saying it sound bad, but almost talking about um, you can have a bad day and it won't necessarily muck the whole thing up. Absolutely. Cool. Abdullah, any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, uh, I think Kevin's answered it really well, to be honest. Uh, yeah. He's got experience of delivering GCSE as well. Uh, I have um, been teaching vocationals uh, since I've got into education, so I'll leave, oh. I'll leave the response to Kevin there. <laughs> That's all good. Cool. And that actually led on quite nicely to one of the questions that I saw pop through in the chat actually around do students have to pass both elements of the visa qualifications um, and the answer to that one is no so the qualification is completely compensatory so um, so you know a learner could do I mean we wouldn't recommend it but you know a learner could do incredibly well on the project side of things and then just not show up for the exam and they would still achieve some grade at the end of it so it is completely compensatory um, every mark counts essentially with the new qualifications. I'm glad that bit got through as well because yeah. that really was a, a a very almost a very attractive feature of what's going on. Yeah, definitely. I think we've been through the mastery models before where you've had to pass every single element and I think that was one of the things that stuck with this model which is good. Yeah, I remember teaching BTEC and other qualifications like that, sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, almost having to dot the i's and tick them and making sure that every word was in the right place. Now I, I, I sometimes wondered what was the point of doing that and what were the people what were our students learning through that? Okay, so I'll go on to some of the other questions. So one of the next ones we've got is um, 
will the options packs when will the options packs be available sorry um, so we should have them available by the end of this month. So we are working on them as we speak imminently. Um, so do look out for an email about those and keep an eye on the website um, for information about when, when and where to download them from. Um, another one is do learners need to be enrolled to look at the support materials? So for the specs and the sample assessment materials and the fact sheets, no, they're just openly available to everybody. So you can just access them straight through the website. Um, but for things like the teaching and learning materials, um, yes, so you'll have to um, register with us to deliver the qualification when pre-approvals opens. Um, and then the resources will be available through our kind of portal um, before September. So you can access them before September before you start teaching. Okay, and then there was another question that came through on email, which was around um, how do you become a centre with NCFE and, you know, what's the kind of approvals process? So, Kelly, I don't know if you maybe want to take that one and just talk about that onboarding approvals process a little bit. Yeah, sure, no bother. Hi, everyone. It's been great being uh, on here today, listening to all the, the exciting stuff that's going on and that's to come. So how do centres get approval then? So gaining approval for any of our qualifications is really simple and easy. So as soon as the call's open for pre-approvals, you'll be able to go to our website and you can click on the relevant tab and then just follow our step-by-step -step guide uh, to find out actually how easy it is to get started with us. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, and then another question that we've had come through is, so is food and cookery definitely finalised for delivery from September? And yes, it is, absolutely is, we're sure it's on the performance tables um, and the specs on the website for you to access now, so we are thrilled about that one. Hooray! <laughs> um, next one is, when is moderation? So external moderation will take place from the 30th of April. Um, and we'll be doing that and that will be um, the deadline to upload any of the non-exam assessment marks and we will be putting a non-exam assessment um, administration guide on the website shortly as well to kind of provide some further clarification around more of the technical um, steps that need to, to happen to administer that so again we'll share that information with you really shortly. Okay, next question is, um, is this only a level two qualification? So all of the qualifications that you saw on the screen, all 11 of them, they're all combined level one stroke two. Um, so that means if you've got learners who you imagine are gonna achieve a level one grade, um, you'll just put them on the exact same qualification as those learners who are kind of destined to get a level two distinction star. So yeah, it just caters to all learners of all abilities. Okay, the next question was, can you run subjects that are similar to GCSE and get funding to deliver both, for example, sports studies and GCSE PE? Um, so the thing to look out for on this is going to be the discount codes for the qualifications. So if you go on the DFB website and you can access the performance tables um, kind of spreadsheet, um, look out for which discount codes are associated with each qualification because you won't be able to do two qualifications um, which carry the same discount code, they'll kind of cancel each other out. So it would just be one or the other. Um, okay, and I've already answered the one around do students have to pass both elements? So that's great. Um, the next question was another one on email, which was when can we start registering learners on the new V-certs? Um, so registrations will open for the new qualifications on the 1st of September. So there's no rush to have um, a kind of list of students or student numbers or anything straight away. Um, but we will open pre-approvals ahead of September. Although I'm sorry, I don't think I've got the exact date for that yet. Um, but again, we'll make a note of that after the presentation and we'll make sure that we share the exact dates and everything with you um, straight after this. So if I just do a quick look for any more questions that have come through. You just bear with me. Um, or somebody missed the answer there on when resources will be available. Um, yet yeah, the options evening packs will be coming at the end of this month. So yes, that should, that should just catch you for February the 1st. 
Um, will there be textbooks for the qualifications? That's another great question. Um, yes, so we're working with Hodder, who are developing textbooks for our business and enterprise, health and fitness, and child development and care qualifications. So there'll be textbooks coming with all three of those. And we're also working with iAchieve, um, who do kind of online delivery resources as well. And they'll be creating resources for a number of the BCERTs as well. Um, Kelly's going to be kind of taking everybody through the deep dive subject discovery webinars over the next few weeks and we'll have details of all of the kind of extra resources from third parties that will be available through those. Um, another question is, will the old research stop? So yes, the old models, the ones that are kind of currently on the performance tables will cease to carry points from 2023. So this year's year 10 cohort is the last cohort of learners that would go through those qualifications. Um, so we will be withdrawing those qualifications from the market in January of 2023, just to make sure that if there's any kind of late registrations on them, we can still accept them. Um, but after that, we would expect everybody to have transitioned over to the new model V certs. If you're registering any learners um, on them existing models who are currently in year nine, um, be aware they won't carry performance points from 2024, so it will only be the new qualifications that carry the performance points from next year. Okay, having a quick scan through the other questions. I think, do we have time for one more? Maybe. Okay, does historically delivering NCFE mean you are already pre-approved? That's another great question. I haven't got the answer to that one at the moment, but I'll make sure that we include that in the follow up comms as well. And I think that might be all we've got time for on the panel Q&A. If, um, if there's any other questions, by all means, keep throwing them in there and we'll try and pick them up after the session. Um, and, you know, we can probably work something out with marketing to get a Q&A article written or something. We'll make sure we follow up on the questions. OK, and that quite sadly actually brings us to the end of the event today. Um, I really do hope you've all found it useful and I hope you've all enjoyed it as well. I think we've had some really great speakers on today and I would like to extend a huge thanks to the guest speakers who joined us for the sessions today. And I also want to extend a big thanks to the colleagues who've been working behind the scenes to make everything work today and make everything go as smoothly as possible. So a big thanks to everyone. Um, if you've got any feedback on the event today, um, there'll be an email follow up coming out with a short survey in there to kind of give us some feedback. But by all means, pop stuff in the chat as well if you've enjoyed it or if there's anything you think we could improve on. And if you take nothing else away, just keep an eye on the website because we're going to be updating that imminently with lots of new information. Um, so do just keep an eye on them pages as, as you know, like as things unfold. So I'm going to be sticking around. Um, I think all of our speakers are going to be hanging around for an extra 10 minutes as well. Um, so we'll be allowing people to unmute, to turn the cameras on. If you want to come and have a chat with us, that's absolutely fine. Um, but otherwise, you are free to go. I do appreciate it's 20 past five on a Thursday night. Um, so just thanks again for joining us today. And if you're not sticking around, have a fantastic evening. Take care.